so that everything is going fine. Okay, assalamu alaikum, bismillah rahman rahim. Uh, it's our great pleasure to have you today with us with the great, uh, our dearest colleague, Ms. Dawn Pingrose, the principal of organizational excellence specialists in Canada. Uh, welcome everyone for our session today. I've been planning for this session for a long time, but last time we could manage it. And we said that it's because it's November and the World Quality Month. We have to get one of the gurus, excellent and quality gurus to be with us today. So we're having today, uh, we came here from many partners. We used to be HI leaders quite only, but here we have a lot of uh, partners now with us today. And our main aim is to help people working in HR, organizational development, quality, organizational excellence to come together, to share knowledge and connect and develop themselves, develop their organization and hence the whole community. So talking about uh, our dear guest today, is Dawn Ringrose. She's the principal of organizational excellence specialist in Canada. Uh, I cannot talk about her that much, but uh, she has worked in different sectors with different organizations to improve performance in these organizations. And this, these organizations have earned the National Excellence Awards because of her contribution with, with them. She has been working since 1984 in different areas, different industries. And then she developed the, the turnkey toolkit from 2010. And her aim was to make the excellent journey for uh, the people and for the organization simple and more cost effective and time efficient. Uh, she has been working in many conferences worldwide and she has trained professionals in over 20 countries. And uh, as we said, she's a principal of organizational excellence specialist in Canada. And she's board member in Global Benchmarking Network. And she's executive team member uh, in the technical committee in the uh, American Society for Quality. And she is working in the advisory board member in many great foundations and organizations. So Dawn, uh, I leave the, the show to you and uh, I'm sure that uh, it will be a great session. So please take the, the mic and uh, have your presentation and we'll be very glad to, to have you with us today. And please, if you have any questions, write it in the chat box and on the right time, we'll check with Dawn, uh, when can we uh, have these questions and check with her, okay? okay. Please don't. Wonderful. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mohammed, for the kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here today to speak to you about excellence. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. And uh, I, I want to share a, a study uh, that I've been doing and I'm hoping that um, the explanation of the study and the description of, of what I've been doing is going to help all of you in your organizations. Uh, and it's, um, it's an absolute been a passion of mine. The study has been going on over the last almost six years now, since 2015. And it's, it's really designed uh, for all of us around the world to be able to participate in it and benefit by it. So let me share what's been going on. And, uh, and then, of course, I'll be open to any questions that uh, you have as well at the end of the presentation. So uh, throughout the presentation, I'll, I'll be sharing what we've been, been doing, uh, the sorts of results that we're getting from this study. We want to make these results very meaningful and applicable to any organization, any type or size of organization uh, around the world. And of course, uh, across industry sectors, because the results are capturing exactly that. Uh, to what extent have organizations um, got a culture that's committed to excellence, to what extent have they deployed best management practices that we find in, in excellence models. And we want people to, in organizations, to participate in the assessment so that they can see how they measure up, how they compare to others, and then go on from there in terms of next steps to aspire to get better and better and better. Now, this study was first launched by the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee, which is part of the Quality Management Division at ASQ. 
And, and this committee has been really interesting because there's a number of representatives on it. Uh, we all represent, you know, different excellence models, different parts of the world, but we're, we're there to work together, you know, towards a common aim, which is making organizations aware about excellence models and encouraging them to use them. Because I'll tell you, it's a well-kept secret. We know that only about 10% of the working population knows about excellence models. And uh, it's, they've been around since, you know, late 80s or early 90s, and <clears throat> it makes a real difference to use one. So this is our, our mission really is to create more awareness so people can benefit by it. <clears throat> My firm was, uh, uh, in charge of leading the study. And it's because I've developed an integrated excellence model that combined what we know uh, in excellence. Uh, and, and then I also had an automated assessment and reporting tool, which uh, made it easier to capture all the results and, and report on them. And the study had been supported uh, by the Global Benchmarking Network. Uh, and, and this support was really in terms of helping create awareness out there about the study, but also the ISO Technical Committee 176, which is in charge of 9001, um, and the International Academy for Quality. And I must say the real rock stars in all of this are the core and support research professionals, because over the last six years, we've had up to about 500 wonderful people around the world that have been participating as research professionals and making their contacts aware of the study, inviting them to participate. And this is uh, how we've been able to achieve a good cross-section of respondents so that we can say quite confidently what's going on in terms of excellence in organizations around the world. And of course, Mohammed, who's hosting today, has been one of those very valued uh, research professionals. And is you know it's a wonderful network that a lot of our research professionals have, and and they have the ability to go out and invite people to participate. And uh, those trusted relationships are important in us getting a good a good database of respondents. So here's a picture of the excellence model um, that I I pulled together back in 2010. I looked at all the wonderful work that had been done in excellence models. Uh, around the world over, you know, the last 25 years or so. And I thought to myself, all the models are very similar, but they do have their unique features. And I thought, well, why don't we have all of this in one place? You know, so we've got a description of the principles oh, that characterize uh, a culture that's committed to excellence, uh, all in one place, along with all of the key management areas and all the best management practices that are in excellence models as well. And so I put this, this all in one place and it not only defines these principles and best management practices that we know are common to high performing organizations, but then it went one step further and it, it added uh, to this, how do we implement it? Because that had been missing in the, in the literature. And I've, I've been a certified management consultant for you know, the last 35 years. And so this is part of what we do. And I thought, let's combine what we know in excellence with how we implement it in management consulting. So this is beneficial to people working in organizations and they can, they can use what we know works well. It's tried and true. And so this publication is available on my website. People can download it at no charge because I'm really interested in just getting this good information out uh, in people's hands so they can use it for their benefit. And if we take a look at the, the principles of high performing organizations, um, this is a description of the culture and the way people work together. You know, leaders that are involved, everything that the organization does is aligned with the strategic direction, vision, the mission, the goals and objectives. There's a real focus on the customer. People are engaged and involved. There's a, a mindset of uh, prevention so that if problems occur, people are asking themselves, how do we prevent that from happening again? Good partnership uh, development, win-win relationships with suppliers and partners, uh, a mindset of continuous improvement. So people are always asking the question, what are we doing now and how can we do it better? Of course, uh, decisions are made on the basis of, of data that is collected. 
And there's a real commitment to society, to making the world or the, the community a better place. And of course, there's these key management areas that we have in most organizations. And this is where all the best management practices reside. And in a micro size organization that has one to 25 employees, of course, there's fewer practices that you need to have in place. There's, there's 51 in total across these areas. And in larger size organization, there's 102. So it's very, very comprehensive. Uh, and in, I must say, in all my years of management consulting, issues that arise in organizations, um, you know, it's very, it's a great diagnostic because you can take a look at what's going well and what needs to improve in an organization across all of these practices. And it really allows you to focus on, on what are we doing well and where can we improve? So you're building on your strengths and you're addressing, you know, the opportunities for improvement. So within all of these areas are all these best management practices. And uh, this is where we're looking, you know, when we're doing this research is to what extent of organizations have these practices in place. So when we collected the data, and I want to really emphasize that this is all strictly confidential, we'll never reveal or report any individual organization data. It is, uh, we just aggregate. Uh, the data so that we can we can share the findings so people can have a general idea about the findings but we gathered information on the role of the respondent were they a leader manager staff were they in other position like a board member what was the size of the organization and this is on the basis of number of employees from micro small medium and large uh, the type uh, of the organization was it government, business, nonprofit? What was the industry sector? And we used a, an industrial um, a classification. It's an international classification that has 21 industry sectors and their subsectors um, to highlight what industry sector an organization was from. And then of course the country. And, uh, and we're using a World Bank analytical grouping if we speak about the region. So countries fall into various regions uh, around the room, around the world. But we, in, in the respondents, were really self-assessing their organization on these principles and best management practices. And they were also providing open-ended comments. And this provided additional feedback on, on how the organization uh, was doing on these principles and best management practices. And in some cases, we had more than one respondent from an organization, which is very interesting when it comes to taking a look at how you know, reliable or valid the, the, the results are. And we've been sharing uh, the results uh, at various stages along the way of this study so that uh, the working population becomes more aware. Uh, they can take a look at how their organization is doing uh, against other organizations, and we've tried to get the word out there at uh, through newsletters and conferences uh, over the last six years. So it, it's really a project that's meant to benefit uh, everyone, a collaborative project where we get people working together towards a common aim of sharing what excellence is, how it can benefit organizations, encouraging people to participate. And uh, it's it's really intended to benefit all stakeholders. So let's take a look at some of these results. Um, the teaser assessment was, we used a more subjective rating scale here to ask people to take a look at their organization and, and self-assess against the nine principles. And uh, it, it gave us you know, their gut feel about the extent to which their culture was characterized by these principles. And as you see, we've got you know, quite a number of organizations that were responding across the 21 industry sectors and in all the regions of, of the world. And we were hoping that mostly leadership and management would be responding because they're in that role, they have a pretty good idea of the kind of management system they have in place in the organization. And we were successful there. We, we certainly had more businesses responding than we did in the non, or as compared to the nonprofit or government sector. And we had, uh, you know, very good response from micro size organizations, but, but 
but a good cross section of respondents. So we've been really, really pleased with these results. And these are the results as of the end of uh, 2019. And I must say, we're continuing the study and we've got a, twice as many respondents now. So we're trying to fill in um, some of those industry sectors and countries and things like that where, where we needed to uh, attract more respondents. And we'll be reporting those results in early 2021. But here, here are the results on the teaser assessment. So what kind of culture do organizations have? And, and we can see that on, on the principles um, that uh, there's strength in the leadership involvement and focus on the customer area. And then maybe some work to do when it comes to prevention-based process management and database decision-making. And if you, you take a look at the scale from zero, zero to 10, I think a lot of organizations are reporting quite positively in this respect because they're in a, in a category where they're doing quite, quite well and things are quite stable uh, and positive. Um, if, if we look at this, this scale that we see really high performing organizations would be in the 7.5 to 10 uh, range. So we're sitting in a very comfortable range here, very positive. So this is very good feedback on the culture of excellence in organizations. Taking a look uh, by role, we see that leadership is perceiving the principles to be a little bit more positive than uh, their counterparts in, in management and staff positions. And uh, similarly, by type, if we take a look at business, government, and nonprofit, uh, business is perceiving the principles to be a little bit more positive, but followed closely by nonprofit uh, and then government, government. And size is very interesting because micro size organizations have the more positive ratings, uh, followed by large and then small and medium size organizations. And we take a look at general industry sector, manufacturing versus the service sector. We see that the service sector was rating the principles a bit more positively than the manufacturing sector. And when we dive down a little deeper and we had quite a few respondents in these specific industry sectors uh, and they were, um, you know, there was enough respondents there for us to, to report uh, this sort of data, but we see that in the professional, scientific, and technical sector, and this is a sector that includes management consulting and engineering and accounting, um, their, their results were probably the, the highest rated uh, as, as well the, in the financial and insurance sector. And on the other end of the, of the scale, um, Less, you know, the ratings were lower for public administration, which is government, and the construction sector, which is very interesting. And other, other sectors noted here on the screen were, were in between. We take a look at, by region of, of the world. Uh, we see that, you know, most regions are reporting quite positively, but uh, the higher ratings we, we're seeing that in East Asia and Pacific region and Sub-Saharan Africa. And then this I found interesting is what, what countries have we got that are more high responding in, in terms of the more respondents uh, showing an interest in the study. And it could be also the researchers that we have, you know, being influential and, and being to able to attract a lot of respondents. But these are the countries where we were getting pretty good participation. Um, Canada, United States, India were, were quite notable, but these other countries uh, on the on the screen, we're able to attract quite a number of respondents too. So that's a good sign that, that there's interest around the world. We had uh, a number of organizations too. We invited up to, you know, three respondents in in uh, in an organization to participate in the study, and it's always interesting to look at that when you've got a number of respondents from an organization to take a look at the variability in their, in their ratings. And we had 23 organizations with more than one respondent 
located in these countries on the screen. And we took a look at the standard deviation in their responses uh, on their ratings. And we saw that it, it ranged from 0.96 to 3.42. And this is always interesting because if you've got an organization that has got people in the organization know that they're using, let's say an excellence model, they've got a good management system in place. There's a lot of, of very good communication throughout the organization about that management system and how the organization is doing. And people are very engaged and involved in continuous improvement. We, we would see that the standard deviation would be a little bit lower because everybody's in the know and everybody's gonna be rating things similarly. Uh, but if we see a higher standard deviation, that means that, oh, maybe the communication isn't that, isn't as good and people aren't as much in the know about the, the management system, you know? So we see this, uh, this variability and we can see in addition to that, you know, through the comments uh, that people are making uh, about, about the organization. And I must say the comments are so very important. Uh, you know, the ratings give us an indication how an organization is doing, but the comments are very rich in detail. It's often the leaders that uh, are very surprised by the comments because there's things going on in the organization that they didn't know anything about. And those things are real quick wins, things that they can address often quite quickly that really make a difference. So this, the ratings, the open-ended comments, taking a look at the standard deviation and is all very, very valuable. So overall on this teaser assessment on, on the culture, of excellence in the organization, we're, we're seeing that the higher ratings are provided by leadership, micro size, business type of organizations, the service sector, and, and then a, a, the professional scientific technical as a, as a specific sector and the East Asia and, and Pacific region. And again, the highest rated principles, leadership involvement, focus on the customer, and at the other end where some work needs to be done on this prevention-based process management uh, way of thinking and, and database decision-making. And here's one of the comments that uh, I captured from the, the study. And this was from a respondent that just said that this kind of uh, uh, opportunity to self-assess their organization really pointed out that you know, they had some work to do. And this was probably um, a reason why uh, they felt that their organization was a bit adrift at the moment. And yet another respondent that said, this has really helped put into perspective what they need to do to grow and develop their organization so that it is successful and they can indeed leave a legacy to their kids and, and grandkids. So these are wonderful comments. I think uh, gives uh, good feedback about the value that respondents are getting out of the assessment. Now the full assessment, we used a much more objective rating scale uh, and, uh, and we were taking a look at all of those best management practices that we have across key management areas. And uh, we got fewer respondents to this. Uh, uh, it's still a significant number of, of respondents. But I think the reason for this is it took longer to take, you know, to fill this survey out. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes people wanna, wanna be able to do something quickly like the teaser assessment, but the, the full assessment demanded a little bit more time. Uh, but we were pleased with the number of respondents at this point in time, you know, the breadth uh, that we had of respondents across industry sectors and again, the regions of the world. And again, we got, good participation from leadership, management, um, and the business community, and good cross-section of different size and organizations. So we're very, very pleased with this. And as we take a look at the key management areas and how organizations are doing, um, we can see that there's more strength in the governance area um, and uh, the governance practices and the, also the customer practices. And uh, to a certain extent, of course, leadership practices and, and the way they go about measuring the performance of, uh, of the overall organization. Uh, some work to do you know, on some of these, these other areas because the, the ratings are a little bit lower. 
And anything above five, you know, that five to 7.5 range is indicating that these practices are pretty stable. You know, you're getting, you're starting to get pretty good uh, results. You're on, on the path uh, to getting better and better. And then high performance again is in the 7.5 to 10 range. And this is where we find our high performing organizations, our best in class organizations. They're the standouts in an industry sector. Uh, so actually, you know, if you're an organization that's in the five to 7.5 range, you're doing quite well. You know, you've got a good management system in place. Things are stable. You're starting to get good results. And let's take a deeper dive in, into each of these key management areas. Um, one thing I might just uh, say is that you might have noticed the, the difference in the ratings between the teaser assessment on the culture and then how the ratings have dropped significantly uh, on the key management areas. It was very interesting, you know, when you take a much deeper dive into, into the detail, um, all of a sudden those, those ratings drop a little bit. Uh, and because we're using a much more effective rating scale on these. So we see that the, the perceptions or self-assessments that people have uh, dropped, you know, significantly. So here we're taking a look at the detail in each of the, the key management uh, areas. And, and we're seeing on the practice 1.3 that the governance system meets obligations. And this is a good sign because these are legal, financial, ethical reporting obligations. And this is what we want to see in all organizations. And in, in some of the air, other areas, these, this is more applicable, applicable to larger size organizations. We, we see that organizations are, are doing quite, quite well. So that's, that's a very positive uh, feedback on, on the governance area. And when it comes to leadership, there's quite a few more practices uh, here. And uh, we see that organizations, you know, are doing quite well and they're, um, it's quite quite positive uh, feedback in a, in a lot of respects, but there's certainly some areas where, where they need to um, be, be focusing uh, effort. I, I think it's very good to see that, you know, organizations have, have got corporate statements in place like vision, mission, values, goals, and objectives, uh, and and they're um, they've got senior management, you know, commitment uh, to to improvement and and these sorts of things. But there's a real opportunity to do some more work in assessing risk and removing barriers to organizational uh, effectiveness. So. When you're doing a self-assessment on this sort of thing, and it's always good to do it with a number of people in your organization, a good cross-section, this gives you a real view about uh, perceptions about what's going on in the organization, what's going well, what needs to, to improve. And I always find it fascinating to look at the uh, different perceptions uh, in, the, in the roles. You know, how, how does leadership look at this? How does management look at it? How does staff perceive it? You know, uh, it, it gives us additional, you know, detail on those perceptions, which are very, very important. But overall, it gives us an idea of, gee, where are we doing well? Let's build on those strengths and let's address those opportunities for improvement. Uh, Don, if you allow me, I think uh, what you're saying is very important here in the previous point, which regarding that the people can, or different organizations can use this assessment for themselves to identify the areas for improvement. And as you said, the different perceptions of different sections. So I just wanted to uh, stress on this point because it, this is very useful tool that people can use to identify areas for improvement and put plan afterwards. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. And, you know, I also wanna say that this, for some people that aren't familiar with excellence models that this might seem a little bit overwhelming, like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of practices here. Yes, there are, but it's the doing that initial assessment, figuring out how you measure up is really important. And you might wanna look at how you compare it to others. Don't be overwhelmed by the number of practices because usually what happens with organizations is that they take a look at where they're at. And this is a little bit of a baseline. And they'll take a look at where they need to concentrate effort. 
and they'll decide oh, over the next three years, you know, we're going to, we're going to do some work and what are the high priority areas that they want to work on? So they think, well, in year one, we want to work on this area, year two on this area, year three on that, the next area. Don't, don't try to eat the whole big elephant all at once, you know, take it in bite-sized chunks. So um, I really want to stress that because I, I think sometimes organizations can get pretty overwhelmed with this and a lot of organizations that have been operating for a while, they'll be pleasantly surprised because they'll find that they've, they've got a good foundation in place. And yes, there's maybe some work that they need to do and they can do that according to their own time frame over the next number of years. And they can engage and involve all their employees in doing the work uh, so that it's not too onerous on any, any one individual or, or group of people. So in the planning area, uh, we we see some you know some pretty positive rating and in, in the gathering factual information that provides input to the business plan, uh, but a little bit more work that needs to be done in in some of the other planning practices. And you know when you when you think about this COVID pandemic that's hit all of us, um, the lower ratings on having contingency plans in place for unforeseen events kind of jumps out. Uh, as does the conduct a capability gap analysis for resources, because you need resources to apply to your organization so that you can get things done and achieve your goals and objectives. So these are interesting um, ratings, I think, uh, from, from that standpoint. On the customer side of things, and this is where a lot of organizations are uh, very focused, of course, is on their customers. We we see some good ratings in, in organizations determining what the needs and ex expectations of their customers are and their ability to communicate the value of, the, of what they've got to the customer, the products, the services, and, and their ability to align employees on the importance of the customer. But uh, some work that needs to be done in, in doing a little bit more research to better define who the customer is, you know? What are their characteristics? What are their wants, needs, and expectations? And uh, uh, also training employees to be advocates for the customer, to really understand who the customer is and how can they, how can they best support them. On the employee side of things, um, this is uh, another area that um, probably had, uh, you know, slightly lower ratings. Um, I was really encouraged to see that Organizations are encouraging their employees to share ideas um, because and suggestions because this is where a lot of continual improvement comes from is from those people who are actually doing the work and have got ideas about how they can they can do it better uh, and also encouraging what was that there's healthy workplace environment in in place uh, in a lot of organizations. But uh, again, where is there an opportunity for improvement? Um, encouraging employees to be innovative and take calculated risks. Um, this is this is an area that uh, you know can use some some improvement. And uh, you know some of the some of the comments here were were interesting because you know on one hand uh, uh, there was an organization that that certainly said that this was a strength for them that over half of their employees are involved in improvement events and actively working on teams to enhance the performance of the organization. Whereas on the other hand, the, some, there was another a respondent that said, oh, we have to remove the fear of failure, you know? And this is the thing about pursuing excellence is you have to be willing to try things. Is that I, idea or suggestion? Is that new innovation? Is it gonna make a difference? You know, Is it gonna to contribute to improvement? And you need to be patient and test that out um, before, before putting something, something new in place. But it's that uh, spirit that you have to have in an organization of, of in inviting employees to provide their suggestions and ideas because that's an absolute gold mine. Uh, that's where most of your improvement will come from. You know, and then some additional improvement will come from high performing organizations. Gee, what can we learn from them about things that they're doing really well? You know, then that's where we, we uh, get in, involved in, in things like uh, mentoring with those high performing organizations. 
on the work processes side of things. And this is often a bit of a weak spot in a lot of organizations, you know, have they designed and documented the way the work is done? Uh, and this helps them to monitor and control and be consistent and meet standards. Uh, and as you can see from, from the results, um, organizations are taking corrective action when problems occur. And it looks like they've designed and documented the processes, but they need to do more work in monitoring and controlling and analyzing and improving. And they especially need to do a little bit more work when it uh, comes to working collaboratively with others to take a look at the work processes too. Customers, suppliers, partners, looking outside and benchmarking with other organizations. And when we take a look at our, our relationships with suppliers and partners, uh, it's good to see that organizations are using criteria to select the suppliers and partners that they work with. Um, but some work has to be done on developing those win-win uh, arrangements, um, sharing information with suppliers and partners as if they're a member of the you know, internal team uh, and providing feedback, having good communication with them and uh, on, on new products and services and also involving them in the development uh, or adherence to uh, standards. And high performing organizations, they, they go beyond be above and beyond the the published standards you know um they they want to be ex exceptional and and so this is where we need to work together with others to say gee how can we be exceptional on the resource management end of things and these are the resources outside of human resources that we need uh, to run our organizations is the assets we have in place the financial resources the technology that we use and, and so forth. And um, this again is a little lower uh, rated uh, area and uh, we're, looks like we're doing quite well in terms of managing the security of the resources and managing the assets to ensure life cycle performance. But some work needs to be done uh, in terms of developing a strategy to manage our resources uh, wisely using emerging technology you know, for our benefit um, providing access to stakeholders to knowledge and information and pre preparing for resource interruptions. And we know all too well about that over the last year, right? Looking at continuous improvement by key management area. Um, overall, it's this continual improvement mindset, you know, it looks to me like we need to do a little bit more work. Uh, we might be thinking about this with respect to leadership and customers, but we need to think about these other key management areas and always looking at what are we doing now and how can we do it better? And if we take a look at the measures that are being used um, across these key management areas, um, we see that there's some work to be done. Each of these areas, there's a number of measures that can be used to provide an organization with feedback on how they're doing and, and help them focus on where to concentrate effort, where to focus improvement efforts. And this is what I, I love about the excellence models. And this is what I put into chapter nine of the organizational excellence framework is here's all the, the measures that organizations are using across these key management areas. And taking a handful of these measures to provide feedback to your organization is really important. Uh, and then those measures can be, allow you to compare your performance to others because these are commonly used measures. So um, this, is, this is indeed uh, an area where we can roll up our sleeves and, and do a little bit uh, uh, more work. And then if we take a look at the performance measurement for the overall organization, these again are really good, uh, good measures for larger size uh, organizations. And um, you can see that in some areas like the quality of products or services or financial uh, performance, um, customer satisfaction, you know, organizations are doing you know, quite well in that regard. Uh, but if you take a look at micro size organizations, they should be measuring those things too. And they should also be measuring employee satisfaction. And it was a bit of a surprise to me to see that employee satisfaction 
received a low rating because these are the four measures that all organizations should be using, uh, not just micro size. And larger size organizations might have an additional few measures to provide additional feedback to them. But this is, this is very important that um, we start doing a better job in, in terms of uh, measuring employee satisfaction. Again, here's the high responding countries to the full assessment. Um, again, you know, Canada, United States, India showing a lot of interest, but also Colombia, Greece, Trinidad and Tobago, which was wonderful. And just a bit of a summary um, about the principles being rated significantly higher than the key management areas when we look at the teaser versus the full assessment. Uh, and the highest ratings we see in the key management areas for governance and customers, but the lowest rated areas were that, that work that we do with suppliers and partners and resource management. And again, higher ratings. Interesting when we take a look at higher ratings coming from leadership, small size organizations, nonprofit and business types of organizations and the professional scientific technical industry sector. And again, a reminder about the commonly used measures being the quality of that product and service, customer satisfaction and financial measures. But we're, what we're missing is the employee satisfaction. That's so important. I mean, people are at the heart of all of this. Um, they are your most important resource. They're the ones that make uh, excellence work or happen in your organization. Getting them to work together towards that common aim is absolutely vital. And so these are some of the key takeaways uh, that, that I uh, thought, you know, as I looked through the, the data on, on this study is that we really need to strengthen um, empowering people, you know, to be more innovative and to take calculated, educated risks, you know, uh, and that we need to think more about future oriented practices. I mean, what about having a contingency plan if an unforeseen event happens? It could be a pandemic, but it could be a flood or a hurricane or whatever else might hit us too, you know, um, could be an economic downturn. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, that happen and we need to be prepared for that sort of thing. And also thinking about the future too, in terms of capability gap analysis for resources. Look at the interruption that we've had in the supply chain over this, this pandemic. I mean, these sorts of, you know, thinking about the future is really important how we've seen around the world, how some organizations have been more resilient in this pandemic than others. And these are some of the reasons uh, why. And then very, very important, I think, is this whole notion of collaboration. You know, we can be so much stronger by working with others than we can be independently. And so we really have to work with our stakeholders, but not just the people in our organizations, but our customers, our suppliers, our partners, uh, in taking a look at the way we're doing our work and how can we do it better. And that includes things like work processes. And that includes things like looking outside of our organization and other organizations, high performers, to see what we can, we can learn from them through benchmarking. So again, uh, just a, a note about uh, organizations that had more than one respondent from various countries and the standard deviation. Standard deviation, there wasn't quite as much variability on the full assessment um, as on the, on the teaser assessment. And again, some really interesting comments. And, and again, the, the comments to me are people showing an interest and in saying that this has provided a uh, value for them uh, and they see opportunity for improvement in a number of areas. So that's just, that's music to my ears. They're, they're, they're getting, uh, this uh, value out of the self-assessment. And again, uh, someone mentioning that it allowed to, them to look at performance in various elements, maybe take a deeper dive than they normally do. And that's not surprising. As I said earlier, only 10% of the working population even really knows about excellence models. And so this is something new, but it also likely aligns quite nicely with what they're already doing. You know, if they're already using ISO standards or lean or Sigma or some sort of other 
uh, improvement uh, method or tool or technique. It, it all fits beautifully under this umbrella that we have uh, of an excellence model. So I think overall, we've got a good, you know, clear snapshot of where organizations are at, what's going well, what needs to improve. It, it charts the way forward for these organizations. It, it certainly charts the way forward for those working in the excellence uh, and quality community because they know, they'll know better about where they can help organizations uh, uh, to improve. Uh, and I, I think this whole exercise has educated the working population a little bit more about excellence models and how they can use excellence models to their uh, advantage. Um, I think overall, the respondents have really reinforced that going through a self-assessment has been valuable to them uh, and that uh, we're continuing to do this study uh, because we want to work towards a more robust annual index that has really good coverage by industry sector and countries so that, uh, that the working population has even better uh, data to, to, to look at to measure up how they're doing and compare to others. Uh, and then of course, those of us in the excellence community are there uh, to, to help them if they want to benchmark and learn from uh, high performing organizations. And I think this also should involve professionals that have real subject matter expertise in different areas. You know, this is where accounting professionals can get involved. HR professionals can get involved. I mean, all those people that bring their subject expertise to the table and take, take a deep dive into some of these practices, shed additional light, help organizations where they, they need uh, help. Uh, and overall, I think this is all quite important because if you think about higher performing organizations in, in a region, in, in a country, I mean, this bodes well for the local economy, for trade, then all trickles into the resident uh, quality of life. Do you know? So this is, a, this is a good reason why you want countries to get more involved in this too, to become more high performing, because it's very beneficial to them at the end. So we think about it from an organization standpoint, but think about it from a bigger picture standpoint too, from an industry sector standpoint, from a country uh, standpoint from engaging countries around the world to all be part uh, of the global economy in a, in a very sustainable way, right? I mean, there's, there's huge benefits here of, of this sort of, of work being done well. So I'm gonna be working with Mohammed after the session is done today and we're gonna be doing a draw. There's gonna be a person from an organization randomly selected and I'll be able to work with them after uh, the session to so that they can complete the full assessment. And then I'll, I'll be able to prepare a high level summary for them. So they have a snapshot of where their organization is doing well and, and needs to improve. Uh, and I hope that, uh, you know, adds great value for them. It's always great to take a look at your organization in, in that respect. Uh, and then maybe Mohammed will be there close at hand to, to uh, help with next steps. So with that, I'd like just to close by saying thank you so much for your kind attention and to open it up to any questions that you might have, because I know I've provided a lot of information uh, and there, there might well be some questions that I'd be pleased to answer. Thank you so much, Don, for this uh, very nice uh, and comprehensive uh, session showing the results of different organizations worldwide and the different sectors. I think it's, as you said, it's very comprehensive and has a lot of details. And uh, hopefully we can increase the awareness about the excellence models and uh, running effective organizations and so on. Absolutely. And I would, I would really encourage um, organizations that are contemplating uh, participating in this to, to really give, uh, make sure that your self-assessment is really open and honest. Do you know, this is not an award program. There are no winners or losers. It's all about self-assessing your organization in an open and honest manner so that you find out exactly where you are in terms of your current state. 
what are your strengths? What are your opportunities for improvement? And then building on that, you know, uh, seeing how you compare to others, seeing next steps, what you can learn from others. This is all part of that excellence journey of becoming a higher performing organization. So I really want to emphasize that. Uh, that's really important that um, people do this openly and, and honestly. Thank you so much, Don. I'm, I'm asking you if, if anyone has any questions uh, for, for Don to answer. Uh, as you said, Don, I think it's, it's very challenging also uh, in the organizations um, to find the alignment or the perceptions of different levels in the organizations, perception between different departments. Are we ready? even to, uh, to do this assessment, okay, self-assessment or not. And this, so this is very, something very interesting that I've been always uh, thinking about, about uh, where to go deep in the organization. Shall we distribute it to everyone or certain level or what, what, what do you think or what do you suggest to do such self-assessment? I think you're going to get the most comprehensive assessment of your organization if you invite everybody to participate. And so that if prior to doing that, it's very important to educate people in the organization and make them aware of, well, what is an excellence model and why are we doing this? And to reinforce with them that their opinion and their perceptions are very, very important. And that this is what we're soliciting. You know, their ratings, their open-ended comments, we're, we're all doing this together so we can gauge our current state. And from there, we can all work together to improve. So this is the most ideal situation. If you can work with um, all the employees in an organization at all levels and, uh, and welcome, welcome their input. Uh, and it's very interesting to take a look at even the difference in the ratings, maybe by department, uh, by a uh, role in the organization. This is just additional food for thought. And it tells us again, more about what we need to do next. So that's the most ideal situation uh, for this particular study, you know, and we can, we can do that. We can, we can deal with any number of respondents in an organization when we do these sorts of assessments. But for this study, um, you know, getting two or three of your, of your management or leadership personnel to participate in it is a really great start because uh, that whole exercise provides tremendous value. And it uh, is something that is uh, educational and be, they become more aware and they start thinking about other things in their organization that they might not have thought about before. And they might say, gee, maybe this is why we had some of these problems have been occurring is because we've, we're probably not paying very much attention to a particular practice. Mr. Muhammad? Yes, that's, that's right. And that's very important, I think, for, uh, for everyone. Uh, do you have questions, Mr. Jessen? Yes, I do have. I, I did send to uh, Mrs. Down two questions in here in the chat, please, if you if You, you sent her uh, privately, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have to find the chat now. <laughs> but can, can you send it, please, for, for the chat <laughs> for everyone? Oh, here. I, I think I'm going to do in this upcoming year, next year, the year after that, maybe. Um, and so, we, you do it when you have time to do it. Uh, and, uh, and everybody is engaged and, and involved. And this is, the, this is the way you can accelerate improvement um, like none other. The consultant, of course, is important. They're there to provide support. Maybe it's additional training. Maybe they're helping out with certain projects. Uh, they're there to guide uh, the effort and support the, the effort and provide people with help where they need it, do you know? Uh, and so I, I really believe in, in doing it that way because the, um, the management system at the end of the day becomes the organizations and everybody's very involved in it and knows about it, you know? And it's, it's theirs, it's theirs to improve upon with the consultant's help. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, that's the way I've, I've always liked to do projects and, and I those have always run very, very well using that kind of uh, method and approach. Yes, thank you so much. I, I totally agree with you because sometimes the consultant takes the ownership and 
the, 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 the employees or the management team, even they are just watching, okay? So they don't take ownership. So the best thing to do is that, as you said, if you start creating awareness with the support of consultant of, I think it depends also on the maturity level of the organization itself. So yes. if they are mature enough, they can do it. Sometimes you find the quality manager or the excellence manager, they have this good uh, mature practice so they can do it themselves. Otherwise they can use some external body to guide the organization. And also the other important part is regarding how to read the report afterwards. Okay, how to identify areas for improvement and action planning. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is the nice thing about the action planning. I mean, we've, um, our action plans uh, are, they say, okay, what practice do you need to work on? Uh, what are the steps that you need to take to put this in place? Uh, and then we leave it blank. Who's gonna be responsible for doing this? Oh, what time frame? How are you going to measure your progress? Are there any out-of-pocket costs? I mean, usually there's very few out-of-pocket costs. It's, it's the uh, it's the time and energy of uh, of the employees to to do the work when they're uh, able to to do it. And I just um, I'm always delighted when I hear people in in organizations at all levels, especially at staff levels, saying gee, we've never been asked our opinion before. Or we've never been asked to do something like this before. And they, great, they get great delight in being involved. And they, I, people never cease to amaze me in that the great work that they do. And we're there to help support them as the consultant or the trainer. If there's something they need to know more about, we're there to help educate them. So we're transferring this knowledge. So the organization is that much stronger at the end of the day. And that, that to me is uh, what's really important in this, is building stronger, more resilient organizations and having that knowledge reside inside the organization. Yes, that's really great. Before we go to Mr. Jassim uh, questions, let me take the comment from Mr. Mustafa because it relates to what we we're just saying. He was saying that I believe that top management for any organization will not allow any junior staff accessing main information in the company. It means it's better to do it with consultant, okay? So as we said, it, it depends on the maturity level because yes. I, I believe when the organization decides to do this type of assessment and really use it for improvement, this means this style of organization have open culture, they want to involve everyone and so on. So this is not for any organization actually. Yes, you can do the assessment, but to take it afterwards, I think it depends on type of organization. Yes, and you know, every organization is different. Every leader or leadership style is a little bit different. And like you say, it's the maturity level. And if, if we're dealing at one end of the scale where you've got leadership that's a bit more authoritarian and wants this just to be their assessment to start, fine, get the leadership team to do it, you know? Figure yes. out where the organization's at. At the other end of the scale, you might have more open leadership, more progressive leadership that says, you know, we're going to open this up to the whole organization and then invite everybody's input because we we value their protections. Uh, and so this is where you invite all the employees to participate. So, you know, you've got either end of the scale. It's, it's both are good, uh, as well as, let's say, a consultant coming in and maybe doing the first assessment. It really depends on the leader and what the leader wants to do um, and, and how they want to grow the excellence effort, you know, and it, and it could be gradual, you know, and that's fine. I think it's just important to start to, to do that, that assessment and the, the assessment, the self-assessment is going to give you pretty good results as is the assessment done by an external party who's independent objective, like a, a consultant, you know, it's all good at the end of the day. That's really great. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me give the mic to Mr. Jassim, okay, so that he can ask the questions himself. Mr. Jassim, Thank please. Thank you, Mrs. Down. Uh, this is Jassim Romahi from Saudi Arabia. Uh, my first question, as you're aware of the fact that the governance is a big umbrella which has so many definitions for governance, I am receiving the component of governance as an able of which can achieve uh, excellence. So my question, do you agree that 
we can look at excellence as another enabler or well, it's, it's, this is, uh, I just want to repeat your question to make sure that I, I got it. And this is applying excellence to government as, as various ministries. No, um, no, no, no. I am looking for governance, not the government. I am looking for governance. Despite oh, governance. The that there are yeah. so many definitions for governance. Yeah. And, uh, it depends on the sector, but I am talking here in general that governance can we look for, can we receive governance as any pillar for excellence? And Mohammed, maybe you can help me out here just by repeating the, the question because I, I didn't catch, I didn't catch all of it. I think it's a, a question about governance. Well, talk talk about agree. the governance, talk about the governance. Is the governance is enabler for excellence can we consider governance as enabler for excellence? Yeah. Right, Mr. Jessen? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, you know, governance and leadership is, is pretty important. I mean, it uh, if you take a look at the excellence model and the way it's arranged, um, the all the practices in each of these key management areas are in a bit of a chronological order, number one. But where does this all start? You know, where does the... Um, Commitment to excellence start. You know, it starts with the leaders, uh, and it and it starts with them saying, "This is important, and this is where we're going to go." You know, and the and the governance practices in the in this excellence model. There's six of them, and these are governance practices that are important to the excellence journey. You talk to a governance subject matter expert; they're going to talk. They're going to go dive way deeper into governance, but. In, in the excellence model, there's six practices that are really important to good governance. But let's not overlook the leadership as well. That leadership and the importance that they have in communicating that excellence is important and getting everybody involved and engaged in it. And organizations vary. I mean, some in the way they're governed, you know, um, you'll have a business that might have to answer to a board of directors or a government that has to answer answer to the, the people at the end of the day. You've got all sorts of, or you have an entrepreneur that's got a new business that has to answer to themselves, you know. Um, but this is a this is the important thing is that are you using these best practices or not? Uh, and this is going to help you develop and improve and strengthen your organization so it's more resilient and able to adapt to change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you second, have another question, Mr. Jason? Yeah, my second question is that you mentioned that the key management areas is almost more than 100 key management areas. <laughs> and can we use these practices as a benchmark for internal audit purposes? Oh, yeah. 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 The key, there's nine key management areas, and for larger size organizations, there's 102 practices within all of those areas. Um, and so this is, to me, this is a, a wonderful way just to, to start out by doing a self-assessment and seeing where you're at, your current state. And then you do an assessment as you work on improving things, you do an assessment every year to take a look at how things are changing, you know, and you're building on your strengths, you're addressing your opportunities for improvement, you're getting stronger and stronger every year. So it's a it's a wonderful way, uh, you know, to to start out with a foundational uh, assessment and, and build on it. And this is what I love about the global index that we've developed too, because it allows you to compare to others. Gee, how is our organization comparing to other government or business uh, organizations? Uh, and then at some point in the future, when you feel like you've exhausted all the ideas and suggestions and innovation from from within you know uh you say well gee how what can we learn from high performing organizations from best in class organizations and let's say that you've got an organization that's particularly good in the um in the customer area or the suppliers and partners area i mean and you want to become stronger what can you learn from what they're doing what ideas can you get that are applicable uh, to your organization in order to help you improve. 
And so this uh, information that we get from benchmarking is extremely valuable as, as well. But you know, your 90% of improvement is gonna come from the people within the organization who've got great ideas and suggestions about how to, how to do the work better. My last question, Mr. Mohammed, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, what lesson learned from the pandemic corona, COVID-19 pandemic yeah. for the organization? Excellent. Well, you know, as I've been watching what's going on in the, in the pandemic, I mean, it's really a great example for us about um, organizations and their ability to adapt to change. You know, an unforeseen event like this that has affected uh, all of us. But we see that some organizations are more resilient, are more adaptable. We know that these organizations have got a really good management system in place and they've got most of these practices in place and it allows them to be agile and adapt to change and deal with something like this. We, an example of that, we see organizations and I'll just use a couple examples here in, in Canada. I mean, we see organizations that are, have been manufacturing a given product and yes, things have been disrupted. And what do they do? They see that there's a demand for masks and so they, they retool and now they're able to uh, supply masks because there was a shortage here for a time, you know. So that to me is an example of, a, of an organization that's got a pretty good management system in place when they can turn on a dime like that. And then another uh, example that I've noticed here in Canada is that, you know, hospitals are, are having to, to deal uh, with the pandemic and I, I, our numbers here haven't been, haven't been too, too bad, but um, there's still, there's pressure on the, on the healthcare system. And what do we notice? We notice that all the hospitals in Canada have got different suppliers and partners. And we notice there's a shortage of masks and they're worried about running out. And I ask myself, why do they all, why are they all dealing with different suppliers and partners? Because we know that high performing organizations deal with a select few suppliers, trusted suppliers where they have partnering arrangements and in doing so your supplies are not gonna be interrupted, right? So this is what we learned. To me, I look at the healthcare sector here and I say, well, here's an opportunity for improvement. Here's how they can be more resilient and adaptable when, when something like this uh, hits, you know? And I, I've also been taking a look at the data on the COVID, the number of mild versus severe cases, um, how different countries are dealing with it, how the media is responding to it, how the healthcare profession is responding to it. I'm asking myself questions. Are we making database decisions? You know, um, are we, even, even when it comes to reporting cause of death, I mean, is this root cause or is this inflating the statistics? You know, I, I think we've got some real work to do to take a, a much closer look at this pandemic to get a much more realistic um, viewpoint of it. And as a matter of fact, we just, uh, we've done a number of us on the Global Benchmarking Network have just finished um, a global research study on the COVID pandemic. And we're taking a look at it through the, the different set of eyes, you know, than let's say governments or the health profession is looking at it. And we're taking a look at it uh, in, in terms of best practice and data and benchmarking. And we've identified the countries that have been performing well, what they've been doing, and in the hopes that everyone else will benefit by that. And we, of course, there's strengths in what's happening, but there's some opportunities for improvement. And, and all of this is very interesting because we, we can say, okay, let's learn from this. And this is gonna allow us to perform better next time a pandemic hits, you know? And actually we're gonna be presenting on this tonight. Um, well, it's, you know, morning my time here, but uh, later on today, uh, tonight, we're going to be doing this presentation um, uh, in cooperation with the Philippine Society for Quality. So anybody that uh, is interested in, in attending that, 
um, is invited to do so. It's open, it's no charge. There's some really great presentations on innovation and benchmarking. We'll be presenting on this study. We'll be having a panel discussion and uh, we welcome others to participate uh, if, if they're interested. Because hey, we're all in this together. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> we have to learn. We have to learn from each other and build on uh, build on best practice so we can handle this sort of thing better, right? Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. My pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, the great question, Mr. Jassim, and thank you so much, uh, Don, for the, your uh, reply. Mac. Actually, we had been doing some uh, sessions since the pandemic, uh, online sessions. To, to get the feedback from the HR uh, leadership about how they are dealing with the pandemic. And uh, I just said, whenever the, the organization is agile and resilient to take fast decisions because it's not business as usual. So uh, actually it was totally business unusual and they have to act very fast. And there, whenever there is strong leadership or good leadership in place, they can, act on a on, on quick way or they have they're flexible there these decisions they have to empower the employees so we have looking for the different aspects aspects of the excellence models and i've seen that this is the real differentiator between uh, the good and the bad whenever they deal with the pandemic yes absolutely agree with you mohammed absolutely uh, actually, the last thing, because you have taken a lot of, uh, of your time today, but uh, I find a lot of engagement from the audience and we always like to keep this engagement. So the last uh, comment from one of our colleagues, Mr. Nourdin, uh, he was saying that he, he is recommending that we start with the executives first for the organizations and their, their team members or the, the, the first line managers to take the self-assessment. And then after they become mature, they take it to their employees and the other teams in the organization. Yes, that's a very good idea. And um, so people know we've expanded our uh, assessment tools to include a number of different languages. Um, you know, so we're able to make this more accessible to people uh, around the world. And, and so we've got the uh, assessment tools in, in Arabic, if that's of interest, French, English, Spanish, Italian. And uh, that's covering a fair bit of the world uh, population. And uh, I always say, thank goodness the international business language is English. I guess that's what I speak and I'm, I'm terrible. I don't speak uh, other languages. So, um, uh, but this allows us to operate. And we've got, of course, team members that, that speak these different languages that can, can help out with the assessments and the analysis. Uh, but we want to make it easier for respondents to participate in this, so organizations benefit by it. That's really great. Actually, I, I wanted to mention this part that now the survey is in Arabic. Okay, I have the links and uh, we can send it to everyone who participated in this session and also in the LinkedIn page and in our pages as well. So that's, I think that's really great thing that you have done this year in this research that you have now uh, the, the following different languages, so to, to promote more the quality and excellence culture everywhere. So thank you so much for the sheer efforts for this. Oh, my pleasure. It's uh, it's been a real passion of mine doing this study, and I get great joy in in being able to profile what's going on by you know size, industry, sector, country, and and the, by working with good professionals such as yourself. I mean, to, together we're all able to do. A wonderful study like this is, is ultimately going to make a real difference to organizations and industries, sectors, and countries. So I'm uh, excited to continue it and uh, for the benefit of all. That's that's really great. Thank you, Dawn, so much for your time and for your uh, great session today. I always like to be, as you said, uh, with the quality, excellence people, organization development people, okay, so that we can share information, we share exchange knowledge. And the benchmark, benchmark is really something very important that we have to uh, always look for. And uh, it can really add a lot of value to your organization. And it also capture the top management attention. If you are in the quality, excellence, HR, whatever you are, the benchmark can, capture the top management attention.
Absolutely. So thank you so much. Uh, last thing, but uh, I have a request from uh, some of our colleagues here to say that if you can send us the link for uh, the quality conference, benchmarking yes. conference in Philippines. Okay. Absolutely. And I will share it with the people who participated today. That would be wonderful. That's great. It'll be a, a much richer conversation with more participants. That'll be great. I'll send it right away. Sure. So uh, Dawn, thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. And we wish you all the best. And hopefully we can uh, also invite you uh, again in our uh, sessions. That'd be wonderful. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I look forward to that. Thank okay. you so much. All right. Bye, everybody.